I'm Dr. Ohenya Gold, and this is Science on the Street. It's the 1830s, and Boston is a city in the throes of change. The Boston Common, at the center of the city, served many purposes, starting out as pasture land for cows, then as a campground for revolutionary soldiers, more cows, and then was redesignated as a true park. Somewhere for people to gather in times of joy or rage, and to take a stroll through nature. If you visit it today, you can enjoy the peaceful paths, sparkling fountains, shady trees, and cityscapes. And at the heart of it all, squirrels. You know, those delightful little tree rodents that steal your heart, your lunch, and most definitely your girl. Which brings me to the main question for today's episode. Are squirrels, which are naturally woodland creatures, the grittiest and most adaptable city dwellers? Or are they fancy tree rats with less disconcerting tails? First, let's take a look at them. Have you ever really looked at them? Their bushy fur, tiny hands, round bellies, and peaceful demeanor. No, wait, that's Taylor Swift. How does she get into everything? There we go. Squirrels are part of the rodent family, which all have a single pair of continuously growing teeth in their top and bottom jaws. The squirrels we are most familiar with here in Boston are the Eastern Gray Squirrel. They prefer dense forests with ample food sources. So why are they so successful in our urban jungles? At first, they weren't. In the early 1800s, the only squirrels you'd see in major cities like Boston and New York were people's escaped pets. That's right, people had squirrels as pets. It was only around the mid-century that a new human-animal relationship was being established and laboring animals were being replaced by machines. It was then that city planners released squirrels into city green spaces like New York's Central Park and the Boston Common to bring a touch of nature to the dense urban center. They had to have food and nesting boxes delivered to them, like their own personal Uber Eats and Airbnb. And even with that concierge service in place, all the squirrels in the Boston Common died out by the 1870s, possibly from military exercises in that space during the Civil War, or from neglect? Imagine just seeing a Union and Confederate squirrel army going at it using acorns as ammo. It'd be pretty nuts. The late 1870s brought with them a fresh desire for squirrel friends and new park designs to support their needs. Olmsted parks contained more large trees to house and feed the squirrels year-round. Nuts and nest boxes were still offered as supplements and were needed as the squirrel populations grew. But eventually, the squirrels' own adaptability took over. From their release points in city greens, they started taking advantage of the resources that the city had made for the human inhabitants. They were living in people's homes and heads rent-free. The squirrels learned to escape from dogs and cross busy streets using the telephone lines and found safer refuge inside attics and walls. Just ask the squirrel currently living in my roof. It is very cozy. By the end of the century, the squirrels had spread from the Boston Common to Harvard Square, often begging for food from the students attending college, as if college kids can afford extra food. Their constant presence was not taken well by some of the students at the time. And why would they? Nobody likes squirrels in their pants. By the early 1900s, the public maintenance of the squirrel population had become equated with the care of the dependent elderly and impoverished peoples. Eventually, the ecological perspective came into play, and cities began welcoming predators to the squirrels, like red-tailed hawks, peregrine falcons, and domestic cats. If you find yourself strolling through the Boston Common, you may notice that if you stop and look at the squirrels, really look at them, their tiny hands and fluffy tails, those squirrels will stare right back at you, straight into your soul. They may even take tentative steps towards you, their little eyes twinkling with the hope of an easy snack all because they're descended from squirrels that were dependent on humans. You don't and probably shouldn't feed them. There's plenty of natural food for them in the common now. And they don't need your help finding their favorite human snacks. To find out more about the squirrels, I sat down with Dr. Lauren Nolfel Clemens, squirrel expert and wildlife ecologist at Suffolk University. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you, Ahenya. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm very excited to talk about the squirrels. So you're a squirrel expert. Tell me about that. So I have always been a rodent lover, I guess is the best way to put it. Started out with mice. They were kind of my gateway to, to squirrels. Um, a gateway rodent. Yes. Mice are a gateway rodent to many to other squirrels. rodents. Okay. Yes. And then what led you to, to look at the, or to research the squirrels at, in the park? So I spent a lot of time walking around, a lot of energy. So I, was, I walked through the, the garden, the Boston um, Public Garden, frequently, and I noticed the squirrels 
everywhere. Obviously, people are feeding them. There's actually hawks circling half the time, waiting to swoop down to pick up an unattended squirrel. And I said to myself, there's, you know, there's science that needs to be done here. People are feeding these squirrels, but there's also all these trees that are dropping you know, all sorts of acorns and other types of nuts. So I wanted to learn about how much food is available to the squirrels and how much do they depend on the food that people are feeding them. So how much food is available, natural food sources, in places like the, the Public Garden and the Boston Common? So the, the garden was designed to be a habitat for urban wildlife. So there's surprisingly a, a large number of food trees. So there's elm trees, there's lots of oak trees, there's other types of trees that are dropping food. At any given time, there's willow trees, they'll eat the branches off of those. So there is actually calorie-wise, many more calories available to the squirrels than they could possibly ever eat in a year, just available from the trees. So even though the squirrel population seems really quite successful and abundant in those spaces, the trees produce enough food to cover the amount of squirrels that's in the spaces themselves? Now they do. So when the park first was, was created, the trees were obviously much smaller. They didn't provide ample food or habitat for the squirrels. So when it was first imagined, there were little boxes for the squirrels to live in, and they were pretty much just hand-fed by people. So these squirrels come from you know, a multi-generational squirrel family that's been taking food from humans for, I don't know what the human equivalent would be, th probably thousands of human years <laughs> in squirrel generational time. So those people feeding the squirrels, were they giving them actual like nutritious squirrel food, or is it something like they had like chips in their pocket and that's what they were giving the squirrels? Well, probably the 1800s equivalent of chips, yes. I mean, I'm, <laughs> so, yeah, when it all began, people were just kind of casually feeding squirrels. So when the park was imagined, there was a very different idea about urban wildlife. You know, squirrels were kind of considered a novelty in cities. They were, you know, sort of partially tame. Actually, during that time, a lot of people had squirrels as pets, too. So they were considered kind of this, like, semi-tame, semi-domesticated, like, friend in the park. You went to go feed them with, the, you know, the family on the weekends or something like that. So Fun for everybody. Yes. The squirrels were kind of fun family entertainment. Um, and since they weren't really living in trees initially, they were kind of in nest boxes. It was really even more like, you know, as if it's like a dog coming out of the doghouse. <laughs> There's Mr. Squirrel, Miss Squirrel, whatever, coming out of their nest box for your 1800s chips. Um, how much of their diet today is fulfilled by human handouts? So that's, that's difficult to measure. They do actively beg. As soon as food is available from humans, they do beg. Um, but they also do eat a lot of the natural food. It really depends on the time of the year. So when the trees are masting, which is when they're dropping all their acorns and nuts and things like that, primarily in the fall, they're depending a lot on those types of food and will actually ignore people who are trying to feed them, you know, not the best, you know, there's a wide variety of human food handouts. Like something like a piece of bread is not very great. A french fry is marginal. You know, a peanut's pretty good. You know, a completely unroasted nut is like as good as it's going to get with a nice thick shell. So they're much more judgy about human food when it's the time of year when the trees are producing a lot of food. And then, you know, this time of year when there's less food available, they're a lot more kind of keyed into humans and what they're feeding them. And then during COVID, everyone went on lockdown. Fewer people were walking around. Definitely fewer people were walking around in big public spaces like the common and the public garden. Did you notice a difference in squirrel behavior during that time? We noticed a definite drop in the number of squirrels that were present. Whether or not this was indicative of an actual drop in the population, we didn't, we didn't um, mark the animals in any way, so we didn't know individual by individual, and we didn't have a, a really good population count, but we did have excellent data on squirrel activity. So they were a lot more active and there was a lot more squirrels on the ground and visible before the pandemic. And then during the pandemic, the number of squirrels that were visible at the same times of day, at the same times of year, had halved. So uh, we were unsure whether it was just the squirrels were less active because there weren't potentially you know, feeders around or if this actually signified a drop in the population. Interesting. I mean, they reproduce relatively frequently a few times a year, so even if the population dropped, if food became available to them again, they could rebound relatively quickly. And now that people have started coming out again and wandering the park and feeding the, you know, doing the, the family activity of feeding the squirrels, have you noticed any sort of changes back to the, the, the way they were pre-COVID? Anecdotally, yes. I haven't um, collected data in the same sort of um, formal way that I did previously, but I've been, I go out nearly every day and I do kind of a informal count of the squirrels and they're definitely a lot more 
active and there's a lot more people feeding them than during the pandemic. There's a couple of regulars that I noticed that bring a shopping bag. They put it down and then they, they also speak with the squirrels. So there's a whole other aspect which I didn't collect any data on about conversing with the squirrels, naming them, and they, you know, they jump into the bag. There's full-on feeding going on. Um, and if you go to, there's also just shells of nuts everywhere. And there's a new food that people have introduced recently, pistachios. Now, I haven't had a chance to ask the squirrels how they feel about the pistachio nuts, but there's a lot more pistachio shells than I've ever noticed. It's like the post-pandemic pistachio feeding. I don't know. It's all those pistachios that people kept in their cupboard just in case and then didn't eat them. Um, what are you going to do with them? Like, they're okay, but you could just give them to the squirrels. It's probably fine. I right. feel like that's actually a thing because honestly, <laughs> having looked at lots of nutshells, because I'm not, you know, this is part of the whole watching the squirrels and being, you know, a squirrel expert is, you know, you know, usually it's like walnuts, some hazelnuts, occasionally there's some almonds, but all of a sudden, pistachios for the win. You kept them just in case, and now they're gonna go to the squirrels. It's nothing else you can do. Yeah, and they're really noticeable too, because you know pistachio shells. Yeah. In your opinion, professionally, as a yes. squirrel expert. Are squirrels the ultimate Bostonians? Well, I'd say I'd characterize Bostonians by two different things. One is being a sports fan, and I can't speak to that part. But the second is being somewhat obsessed with weather. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed this, but people in Boston are always you know, asking if it's nice out, they say it won't last. If it's cold out, they lament. And squirrels definitely are Bostonians in that their activity is really tied to the weather. So today it was windy, but it was kind of warm. They were like hanging out in the sun doing a lot of digging, burying the food they got from people. But all those pistachios? All the pistachios, yes, and the walnuts. There was a, f there was a few people with the walnuts today, not, a many, not many peanuts today. But um, when there's a lot of snow on the ground, they're not as active because their body's close to the ground. But they definitely are just as attuned to weather as the ultimate and every Bos real Bostonians in that way. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on Science on the Street, and we look forward to having you all back next time. Thank you. Wow, this is a lot of fun. Hello, sir. How are you feeling today about the COVID situation? Has it been affecting your food supplies? Please say something. Alrighty. Is that peanut the same taste as a chipotle? I would like to know. Do you like this? More chips and salsa. Do we like more chips? Yes. Okay.